So um, we have a very distinguished cast today, and I will introduce them briefly one by one. And uh, there are longer uh, descriptions of our speakers on our website, but I will keep it very short. Um, otherwise, I think this introduction would take too long. So um, Professor Michael Cox um, is Professor of International Relations at LSE, uh, and also the founding director of LSE Ideas, the think tank. Um, he's an associate fellow at Chatham House, and he has over 30 books uh, to his name on international relations related uh, issues. Um, then our second speaker is Francois Gaudemont. Um, he is senior advisor to Institut Montaigne in Paris. Uh, he's a non-resident senior fellow of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace in Washington, DC. Uh, and he is a consultant to the French Ministry for Europe and Foreign Affairs. Uh, and he has also written uh, extensively. Then third, we have uh, Noriyuki Shikata. Uh, he is cabinet secretary for public affairs uh, in, in the Japanese government. Um, before that, he was assistant minister and director general of the Economic Affairs Bureau of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, he's had a number of other postings uh, around the world for the Japanese foreign ministry, including in China, and here in London, where I'm sure many of the participants will remember him. And he's had some stints in academia as well at Kyoto and Harvard. And then fourthly, uh, Dr. Yuka Kobayashi uh, is lecturer and assistant professor in China and international politics at SOAS. Uh, and she's also a visiting research professor at Nankai University in China and a visiting scholar at the World Trade Organization. And uh, this session will be chaired by Vincent Ni. Nee, and all I'm going to say about him is that he is the Guardian's China Affairs Correspondent. And um, this is the approximate timeline. Um, we are going, I think, to try and wrap up at one o'clock fairly uh, promptly. So I'm now going to pass over to Vincent Nee to chair. Right. Thanks very much, Jason. Good afternoon, everyone, um, for tuning in from the UK, and good evening to everyone who are dialing from um, uh, Asia, in particular in Japan. Um, so we are talking about AUKUS this afternoon and this evening, and with a view on the geopolitical implication on Asia. But you know, if we remember uh, two months ago when this deal was first announced, it was France that expressed its anger, as well as China, of course. So I would like to um, turn to Francois first. Um, when this deal was first announced, Francois, there was fury and anger uh, in Paris. Uh, the foreign minister called it a stab in the back and also a major breach of trust and contempt. Now, 10 weeks on, has this anger still linger? Is this anger still lingering in Paris? And if that's the case, how has this AUKUS deal changed the dynamics between Paris and London and Paris and Washington? Thank you, Vincent, and uh, thank you to the Daiwa Foundation and, uh, uh, for the, uh, inviting me uh, to speak on this uh, issue today. Uh, I'd like to point out, Vincent, that your own paper, The Guardian, published maybe three days ago, a lengthy article uh, on, on, on these issues viewed in the light of the recent day, which isn't that bad, I would say. It's actually very good with one or two points that I would defer. Uh, but he's, uh, it's uh, more or less pinpointing some of the issues uh, on both sides. Uh, I don't know if there are two sides, or I would rather say there are four sides, at, at least, not counting China and the other Asians, but just the three August members uh, and, 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 and France. Uh, uh, and I have to preface this by saying that the uh, whole Indopac strategy story has been uh, initiated in Europe by France and essentially by the MOD to start with, with a series of, 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 of papers uh, and the French uh, uh, specificity in Indopak has been that it's pretty focused on defense and security issues. This has been rebalanced later. Uh, the president, uh, Macron, uh, when he went to Australia, rebalanced it in a, in a keynote speech, uh, which is often cited. 
uh, but it's a French specificity, uh, just as uh, the connection uh, with Australia has deepened considerably over the years on security and defense issues, uh, and not only uh, on the submarines, uh, even if submarines were the biggest deal. Uh, I'd also uh, point out that uh, this is not the case for the rest of Europe, that it's, it, it has proven a long and reasonably convoluted road uh, to have others, and to this day, you know, especially Germany, the Dutch, and now the EU, uh, express uh, their own Indo-Pak strategy, partially and converging or overlapping uh, with the French, but not completely. You can note that, uh, uh, especially for the, for the German paper, there is more emphasis on comprehensive security, shall we say, or other uh, ways of cooperating into the uh, Indo-Pacific and less on hard uh, security. The uh, EU paper is fairly balanced, but it's a paper uh, for the time being. Uh, we have to look at uh, what, how it will be uh, fulfilled. So the French had the perception that they were just a little out in front. And of course, this submarine deal was uh, uh, a jewel in the crown, so to speak. Uh, it's probable that the government at the time hyped somewhat uh, the amounts involved because they I noticed that they, the amounts mentions, mentioned have been diminishing uh, since uh, 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 the AUKUS surprise, shall we say. And uh, we are made more aware, for example, of the very large general dynamics contribution uh, to the overall uh, contract. But guns uh, cannot be paid without butter, so to speak. Uh, and given the limited potential of the French defense budget uh, uh, on a number of developments, uh, it's clear that a contract like this does have financial implications by itself. Uh, the second uh, aspect is, of course, the surprise in itself. As we know, it's debated now by the Australian prime minister who claims that he, in fact, gave some kind of warning uh, to the French. Uh, it's very surprising to me, uh, even to this day, that the U.S. president uh, explains, takes the care to explain how clumsy his administration has been on this deal, if he felt secure that somehow uh, the other main party in the AUKUS uh, uh, pact uh, had somehow or other informed the French. Uh, it's very, very rare that a U.S. president issue something that's close to an apology, if not an apology, uh, on a direct act of uh, his administration. And, and so I, 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 even though I'm not ignorant of the fact that a deal such as this posed very big problems, uh, technical problems, transfer problems, uh, uh, all sorts of things. And if you look at, uh, in fact, almost all su large submarine construction projects, they uh, seem to be plagued by issues very often. They very often run over cost. Uh, they very often have other issues. And so it would be very unique if the French deal with a country that has never built a submarine and that was uh, having the ambition uh, to transfer a lot of capacities uh, did not encounter those problems. But having said that, it remains uh, that, as I understand it, the French had been assured that the thing uh, was on track. The first phase of preparatory work had been satisfactorily completed, and this was done uh, in writing. And uh, there had been, you know, uh, uh, two, 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 two plus two uh, meetings between the Australians and the French, official one right before with the communiques, which said absolutely nothing of the such. So on the whole, I do tend to side with my own folks on the character of the surprise. Uh, and that is very worrying, even if all trade deal, all arms deals are full of twists and turns and uh, you know, backstabbing is not unique. It's not a unique development, especially when you're looking for a contract, but this contract was on track. This contract was already being implemented. There was a lot of commitment. There were hundreds of Australian uh, and their families uh, in Brest. Uh, uh, so it's really very special. Uh, it counts mm. as a very special development. So we have to look for, of course, to political and strategic factors. Are we still in fury? No, uh, I think the fury has abated. Are we still angry? Probably yes. Uh, or at least cautious and worried. Uh, 
But this clearly applies uh, in uh, ascending order to the relationship with America, the relationship with the UK, and the relationship with Australia. Mm -hmm. uh, with the US, it's clear that the process has been initiated uh, to patch up what could be patched up. You can't remake the deal. Uh, 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 there is a, a, a real development, uh, which is obvious, which we should, of course, comment on separately. Uh, but uh, France has been able to, to, to transform the incident so that it is a, a it's not a completely new affirmation, but it's a strong reaffirmation of support for European defense uh, instead of, 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 of you know, choosing to ignore it or to doubt it. Uh, it has, so far as I know, because I know there are several topics under discussion that I don't necessarily today uh, know the result of these talks, but there have been uh, a series of positive gestures by the US. Uh, the most publicized one is probably that which applies to support and logistical support and other forms of support to Sahel, Mali, which is uh, very much uh, a security concern for the French and for many Europeans, uh, and so on. Uh, so that can't say we're completely uh, back to business as usual, especially because I don't know uh, what are what is the endpoint of these uh, uh, talks, which are not public. Uh, but things are patching up. To me, in this context, the main, the most important point is that this could have led to French backtracking. Uh, over its security engagement and commitment in the indo pak and to a change of, of speech. That hasn't happened. On the contrary, uh, we're promising to uh, sort of double up on our presence, probably to make up with other uh, Asian partners with uh, the ground uh, that has been lost, uh, hopefully temporarily, uh, with Australia. So there is that reassuring element. I know you're going to ask a question on... Uh, Differences of, of speech between the French and Americans, you know, the so-called third way talk. The we absolutely, yeah. We'll, we'll leave it to our audience to 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 ask a question. Yeah, and also sure just they, a, remind, re a reminder to our audience okay. that with um, the UK, with the UK, and I'll, absolutely, I'll, I'll be absolutely, very clear. with the UK, <laughs> right. the issues are so many now, and 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 and, and, and there is such a versatility. Uh, and, and, and proneness to what I personally would call provocations uh, by the, the current uh, uh, UK Prime Minister, that sometimes I feel we're back to 1800. I've joked about that with a friend, you know, uh, when our, our, our Corsairs and your Corsairs uh, were... Uh, these, these days, the UK talks about global Britain. Michael, I wanted to bring you in. Mm. Does this AUKUS deal tell us anything about the future of this so-called post-Brexit global Britain at all? And before you, before you start your answer, uh, just a reminder to our audience that you can always raise your hands and uh, uh, we will, uh, uh, we will um, you know, give you the opportunity to ask questions to our guests. But also, you, know, you can also put your questions into the chat box and we'll answer as many of them as possible in the Q&A uh, section. Michael, over to you. Thanks. And very, very nice to be on the same platform with my old friend, Francois. <laughs> And uh, sharing many of his criticisms of the of, of, of this, this current administration, and not just on Alcas, but on a whole range of other issues. First thing I think I'd like to say is I think there's a good chance that this particular deal over nuclear powered submarines, though not nuclear armed submarines, very important to note that. Australia remains part of the non-proliferation treaty, and that's crucial. I just wonder if this wouldn't have happened anyway without Brexit and without all this talk of global Britain. I mean, after all, the relationship between the UK, Australia, the United States, just to take those three together, has been pretty close, you know, for 50, 60, in, in Britain's case, of course, ever since Captain Cook landed, um, landed in, in, in near Sydney. So in, in some ways, they're not exactly new partners, these three. They're also members with uh, New Zealand and Canada, as you know, the Five Eyes Intelligence. So they share a lot, and they also share something else, which is called the English language. None of, not, all of which can easily be dismissed as being an, an historical you know, legacy, but I think it does make a big difference. So France, France needs no 
uh, instructions from an Englishman about the importance of language as cultural and, and soft power. And that also forms part of this, this relationship. I, I sometimes don't like the term English speaking world because it suggests all sorts of other things as well. So in some ways, I just wonder, and I've been thinking about this for the last couple of days before preparing my own remarks, did this relationship make this, this deal, uh, which still, by the way, has to be signed off completely. We don't know where these submarines are going to be built. Mm -hmm. We don't know when they're going to be operational. I think quite a lot of the heat in the debate, it, understandably coming from France and to some degree from China, very much so from China, I think much of the heat may be obscures it's in, in some ways, possibly the unimportance, if I might be a bit provocative, of this deal. Because after all, we already have strong relations with Australia and the United States. Um, there's already other relationships in the area, the quad between India, Japan, USA and Australia. You know, so there is already some kind of rough and ready security architecture, which has been created down there, of course, much of it to do with the US. So that's my kind of, you know, let's put a damper on it a wee bit in terms of talking up its importance. It may be much, it may turn out to be in historical terms less important than, than I think we're talking about, although it has created, as Francois correctly points out, a number of short-term difficulties. And of course, our, Ch our Chinese colleagues would always say it's created great difficulties in China. Of course, they see this yet again as part of the Cold War, the degree an attempt to contain China. Although, interestingly, Vincent, I don't know if you noticed that when um, the Australian Prime Minister, uh, Boris Johnson and Biden, presented uh, their justification, they did. They said, this is not directed against anybody. Well, as my grandchildren would say, duh, uh, you know, tell, tell, tell that to the bees. But it's interesting, they didn't specify this is directed against somebody or some other state. It was actually a, a reinforcement of a very strong pre-existing uh, security relationship between these these three uh, uh, countries, of which, of course, the United States is by far and away the most mm. important. It's also, by the way, just to go back to what Francois was saying, then I will answer your question quickly. I, I think it's had a, a short-term impact on the French-British relationship, which was never, which has not been very good at all. After all, let's be honest, honest Francois, since since Brexit. Um, and I think voices like Francois and my own would say, maybe we should calm down a bit, you know, because what the British and the French have in common in terms of worldview, understanding of democracy, human rights, and all the rest, you know, what we have in common is far more important than, uh, than, than what divides us. And I'd like to think that our, ultimately those, those fundamental interests which bring us together, with, 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 whether we're in or outside the EU, Will, will dominate. And I think they will in the end. I think there's, there's quite a lot of cool heads in London, although you wouldn't think it sometimes. And I, I know there's a lot of cool heads in, in Paris as well, which is very good. Now, global Britain. Now, what do you make of this term, Vincent? I don't know what to make of it. I noticed the previous French ambassador to the, the UK, Sylvie Berman, who I got to know very well. Very, very impressive, I have to say. Really, very nice. A very critical book. She was on today's program this morning. Yeah, I, oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. I, it's one day in the week I haven't listened to the today program here in London. And she kind of thinks that this global Britain notion is like an, an emperor with no clothes. Global Britain, in a sense, is an attempt to put some clothes on, on the Brexit deal. I mean, that, in essence, is what it's, what it's about. And so ever since the 16, uh, and we finally got the deal last year, Johnson now has a very large majority, of course, in the House, as you know. Trade ministers have been running around the world signing up deals as part of what is global Britain. If you've got a trade deal to give Britain, they'll take it. By the way, the biggest trade deal they want isn't with Australia or New Zealand. It, it is actually with the United States, and it's the one they're finding most difficult to get. I was talking to a, serious, a number of American uh, senior politicians from the Congress over the weekend, and they're very keen on the trade deal themselves, but would find it very difficult to get. It is, in a sense, the British notion of freedom to pick and choose. It's also inbuilt into the kind of DNA of what, what I call British exceptionalism. You know, We've always been global. The EU constrained us. It was like a straitjacket around us. Let's emancipate ourselves from this terrible straitjacket called the EU and go out into the globe. Britain's always been going out into the globe. We used to call it the British Empire. Then we called it the British Commonwealth. And then we called it British Foreign Direct Investment. We call it you know, all sorts. <laughs> of, so we've always been global, but now there's a name for it. 
Um, is it part of that? Yes, it is. It, you know, in formal terms, as the government understands it, they clearly see this deal as part of something which represents a, a new, you know, constantly searching Britain, seeking new horizons to conquer. I won't go into too many cliches, but you know mm. what I mean. Actually, this year, by the way, Vincent, and, and for our others, it's been quite an important one for Britain in, in terms of what I would call saying, we are back, <laughs> to use a phrase. First of all, you had the success, which was a success, of the AstraZeneca yeah. um, uh, vaccine, which got many criticisms in Europe, but it's turned out to be pretty effective. I think they've, they've claimed this as quite a large victory for British science, not just for Oxford, but for British science. Right. Uh, then we had the G7 meeting down in Cornwall. Again, British leadership, you know, Johnson loved all that, walking along the beach, blowing his hair all over the place. And then, of course, we just had COP26, so I think this particular deal is part and parcel of a view within the government that 221 has actually been a year of, of diplomatic advance and victory. Now, this may not be perceived from outside, where a lot of people think that Britain is actually in, in, in decline as a result of Brexit. But that's the view from within inside the government it, it, itself. The other thing I would say in terms of global is I've looked at this word global Britain several times and from several angles. And in the end, I think what it adds up to is Asia Pacific or Indo Pacific. You know, of course, we'll have economic and political relations with the Commonwealth, clearly, we'll have them with, with the United States. But in many ways, I think it's simply another word for, for Asia Pacific, or as I used to call it, Asia Pacific, and now it's called Indo Pacific. And if you go back and read the March 221 strategic document, uh, global Britain in a Competitive Age, which was written before Alpes, the term Indo-Pacific figures 30 times within it. And the whole, I, I'll finish now, but the whole thing is to, that Britain is now engaged in the Indo-Pacific. And in a way, what happened on September, in a way, flows, if not logically and inevitably, from that larger sense that the world is shifting and Britain will shift towards that world, that world we now call the Indo-Pacific. And the large part of Indo-Pacific is, of course, China. And as you know, Johnson claims Britain is back. Biden says America is back. But is the view also the same in China, Yuka? What, what does China make of this whole deal? You know, the Chinese state on the press said this is a Cold War mentality, demonstration of Cold War mentality. And is this deal actually going to in any way change China's behavior and ambition in the region? And how is this going to complicate China's relationship with the West? It's a really good question, Vincent. Um, first of all, thank you for the invitation and to the organizers. And it's great to be sharing um, this um, discussion with so many um, friendly faces that I know Rod, which I have been able to see quite recently. But um, uh, just answering your question, I think in the sense, um, this kind of, strong alliance really hints a return back to similar kind of alliance systems in the Cold War. And I think this kind of um, similarity gives a lot of ammunition for China to really hype up their world warrior diplomacy, that they're being contained, they're being encircled. So in a sense, I think the short term is that you're going to see a lot more kind of rhetoric from Beijing along these lines, that you actually have these kinds of um, the Anglosphere really encircling um, uh, China. However, I think in the medium term, it's actually exposing the weaknesses of the West, right? In the sense that if you see what's happened with relations between the United States and France, and you can see this kind of divided in the West, like one of the key things the United States tried to do, the Biden administration really tried to do in the first days was really come up with this kind of democratic summit and these kinds of countries were, and linking them with democracy, right? And next month, they're inviting 110 countries um, to get together in the democratic summit. However, if you see what happened right before the AUKUS agreement and after the AUKUS agreement, you're seeing a lot of mixed signals, even in the Anglosphere, in the Commonwealth, New Zealand, right, is voicing some concern. So this is in the medium term, is putting kind of China in a beneficial position to expose that this kind of Cold War narrative of an ideological struggle between mm. China and the rest is really not what it seems to be. So I think you need to divide this kind of what it, the impact has 
on China in the short term, which is this heightened rhetoric from Beijing, which is much more kind of, you know, opposing this kind of containment strategy. But in the medium term, putting China in a beneficial position, if you think about ASEAN countries like Malaysia, and Indonesia, and also exposing this kind of divide between Europe and the United States in terms of the US, UK, EU's kind of strategic autonomy. So this kind of seemingly coherent democratic states is really not. And I think in mm. that sense, you need to divide the impact it has on China's relations with the United States within this kind of short, medium, and long term. And it really counters what you know Jake Sullivan actually said. He's trying to create alliances of situations of strength, right? So the stiff competition in economics and technological, he wants to come up with an alliance of values that's really up to the challenge. And no one really says this is China, but everybody knows this is about China. So in that sense, it's really this words that are not spoken that really is important here. And ironically, I think it's having a beneficial um, push for China in the sense that it actually gives this kind of image factor in the sense that they're this kind of victim, yet this kind of other side is actually quite weakened in position. Biden's approval rates, Harris's approval rates is really the lowest ever, 30%, 20%. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Right. So in that sense, it's really having these kinds of complex relations with um, China. I think you raise a really interesting point, which is, you know, everything is 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 changing still, you know, even the domestic situation in the U.S. But we'll uh, come back to that point later. Um, I want you to bring Nori Salin. Uh, Nori, and. Um, so Nick Carter, uh, who is the UK's chief of defense staff, uh, the other day they said uh, Japan might be one day included into this pact. And we've also got a question from Chris uh, at Brix Brixton, said that someone last week uh, said that UK-Japan relations coined J-A-U-K-U-S. Um, meaning, you know, Japan could be also involved in this sort of a pact, these sort of initiatives. Is there any appetite in Prime Minister Kishida's office in joining this uh, AUKUS deal at, at some point? Well, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to uh, Daiwa, Daiwa Foundation. It's great to be back and uh, seeing many friends. Uh, and uh, in order to answer uh, your question, uh, let me just come up with uh, three points. Uh, Num number one is uh, the regional strategic environment uh, in the Indo-Pacific you know, region has been rapidly changing. And uh, with the strengthening of uh, military power of China or unilateral attempts to change the status quo in the East China Sea or South China Sea. So we are seeing uh, uh, very rapid uh, developments uh, in the security landscape. And from this perspective, we welcome uh, AUKUS uh, enhancing their security cooperation and uh, uh, Prime Minister Kishida and Foreign Minister Hayashi have uh, publicly welcomed uh, the AUKUS uh, partnership. The second point is uh, Japan and AUKUS members uh, share a vision uh, for a free and open Indo-Pacific, uh, FOIP which embraces universal values, uh, such as the rule of law, freedom of navigation, democracy, human rights, as well as international cooperation over coercion. So um, when we are discussing AUKUS, uh, we understand uh, as AUKUS member state that AUKUS is not the pact or an alliance. It is a trilateral partnership to help Australia acquire nuclear powered submarines and to cooperate on advanced technologies relevant to defense capabilities. So um, in response to uh, the Sir Nicholas Carter's uh, comments, uh, Japan looks forward to further deepening our ties with such like you know, minded partners as AUKUS members, Canada and New Zealand and uh, the free and open in the Pacific. Another point, uh, the last point I wish to mention is uh, uh, our relationship with Europe. Japan also values its relationship with the EU members, including France and Germany, which are Japan's important, important partners and vital contribute, contributors to stability, particularly in, in the Indo-Pacific. So we welcome countries like 
the UK, France, and Germany uh, becoming more active uh, in the Indo-Pacific region, and uh, and Japan and the EU support rule-based international order in the Indo-Pacific, and that will further promote cooperation. You know, we will further promote cooperation in areas such as connectivity and maritime security. And, and uh, lastly, in this regard, we are greatly encouraged you know, by individual European countries as well as EU's compilation of strate uh, strat strategies for cooperation in the Indo-Pacific. We highly value them as voices coming from Europe. Uh, this will have a strong impact in realizing the uh, free and open Indo-Pacific from our viewpoint. Mm, that's really interesting. Thank you very mm -hmm. much, Nori. Um, we've got a question from Stephen uh, saying that uh, uh, French economy minister uh, the other day mentioned that Europe needs to build its own defense because the AUKUS pact has demonstrated that the region can no longer rely on the US. To what extent has AUKUS hastened the move towards the EU national army or something similar? I think, you know, similarly, there is a question, France, uh, Francois, and France is going to assume the EU chairmanship uh, next uh, year. Um, do you think uh, this opportunity, this AUKUS presents opportunity to Macron to strengthen his case to relaunch the proposal for stronger European defense because you know Biden has already endorsed it uh, as a result of this uh, dispute with the, uh, the France, right? Francois. There are two very different uh, propositions on a different scale. The reaction to AUKUS and the general issue of a European defense, not to mention a European army, <laughs> That's a much wider and deeper mm. issue. On Locus, I merely would like to say, I, I, I tend to, 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 to side with uh, what uh, uh, Shikata Nori Yuki just, just expressed, which is where it's being hyped too much. It, it's not even a pact, it's a coordination agreement for uh, defense procurement and cooperation on national security generally. It could have potential for, for Australia. We know the uh, implementation period is very, very long indeed. And... Uh, 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 and, and we also know that there is an immediate benefit for the U.S., by the way, immediate and perhaps long lasting if AUKUS endures. Uh, we ourselves, the French, rejoice that this deal with Australia would tie the two countries together for 30 years. The U.S. now, whatever happens in terms of national politics in Australia, uh, can be assured that Australia won't be a fence sitter. Uh, it's really tied in by its procurement agreements to the U.S. and with the nuclear component in a very big way. Uh, so I see the immediate benefit in terms of the U.S. I don't necessarily uh, criticize it, in fact, per se. Uh, for Australia, it's going to be the payback is going to be, uh, shall we say, a little longer. On, on the connection, and I think there was another question asked about, uh, about the consequences uh, on France and Europe, uh, of course, the lack of reliability of the U.S., but, you know, Afghanistan uh, played into that. We don't really underline it every day because most of us left Afghanistan anyway uh, before the U.S. We don't necessarily differ hugely on the decision itself, but rather on the process, uh, which has not led to a very happy outcome so far. That's also a consequence. Uh, but the green light given by Biden counts at least as much, I would say, uh, given the fact that Central and Eastern European uh, member states particularly do rely on U.S. defense as we speak. Uh, so the green light is there. Uh, it is not going to be decided by whatever happens around AUKUS. It it's going to be decided much more on what the new coalition government uh, decides, and even though uh, Germany has embraced uh, 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 strategic sovereignty, its components don't really include defense, and the Greens are a member of the government, uh, there's going to be discussion whether within Europe on whether we concentrate on our neighborhood defense and ask the US, of course, to remain engaged, or whether we are uh, going to extend this uh, to the Indo-Pak collectively. 
Now, I would say about the French, I listened carefully to Michael and I could almost recognize the French, of course, although the British would, would, would not recognize it 100% but say our empire was vastly superior, <laughs> clearly, <laughs> to the attempts at an empire. But why are we in the South Pacific? Why do we have a one million and a half kilometers EEZ? Why do we have a million plus residents there? Why do we have these concerns <laughs> and this care about projection? It's clearly much about the past as about the future, but the past can be used. The past sometimes as a usefulness if you don't transform it into uh, irredentist uh, claims as China uh, is prone to do. So clearly the two of us are both perpetual competitors on interests and, but because we're similar in many of our approaches and, and, and outlook. And by the way, I have uh, never discounted the, the real assets that, China, that the UK has to be a global Britain. Uh, before or after Brexit, with or without your current prime minister. Uh, and sometimes, you know, we feel that we have a bit of, uh, of a road to travel uh, for some of the same uh, mm. assets. So these are really two different uh, mm. questions. And uh, I, I think we have to focus really on the uh, Indo-Pak engagement rather than speculate on the rest uh, of the uh, European defense issues. Mm, that's a really interesting point. Uh, Michael, um, I was reminded that you are also an expert in US politics. Mm. Um, you're just seeing what's happening in the mm. US with the midterm election coming up in a year's time. Mm. Do you think there will be surprise? Um, are you expecting any surprise, you know, bet between this conceptualization of AUKUS and, you know, the, the, the day when this whole thing was turning to reality, it is still going to mm. be a few years away, right? Well, yeah, indeed. Um, if I could just pick up on one or two things that Yuka said, mm. which, which I, I agree with much of what she said. Um, the argument that Yuka put forward, as I understand it, was the West loses and China gains or, or can exploit this, you know, as it has done on many other occasions in the past on many issues. I'm, I'm not so sure about that. I mean, you know, with a president like Biden, unlike Trump, you know, with a president like Biden, I mean, a more consistent strategy and policy commitment to the region. You now, Biden looks like the long term. He may not stay in office for the long term, but unlike Trump, you know, who was you know so irascible and we didn't quite know that he's committed. And that really kind of weakened. So I think Trump did some damage to, to, to the sense of America's commitment. Uh, and Biden much less so. I mean, my bigger worry is, is not just the Chinese reaction, which actually, by the way, was entirely predictable, to be perfectly honest. More, I'm more worried about, one of the, I see one of my old colleagues from Aberystwyth, Nick Wheeler, is listening, and he wrote a wonderful book with Ken Booth on the security dilemma. And my bigger worry on this, really, is we're getting into a security dilemma from which we're never going to be able to escape. And so, therefore, is, is there any escape from this? It seems to me that Alcus, although less significant, than I think many people have suggested, and I think here and I, Francois, and I agree, nonetheless adds to the security dilemma. And I'm not, and how do you get out of one? It's very, very difficult to get out of one once you're in it. And that's my bigger worry, rather than picking up one, one side or the other. Mm. On Biden's approval ratings, yes, they've gone down, down through the floor, but I don't think it's got anything to do with China, if anything. If the Americans can agree on one thing and one thing only, they can agree on China. The consensus, there's no consensus in, in the United States on nearly anything, whether it's wearing a mask or, or anything else. But there is agreement on China. You know, if you look at Biden's strategy, OK, it's more sophisticated. It's, it's delivered in a, in a more mod, a modulated, subtle ways by different kinds of people, such as Jake Sullivan and others. But nonetheless, the policy is broadly speaking the same. That China represents the long term strategic challenge to the United States in the 21st century. And I think that not only has consensus within, within Congress, but also amongst the American people. I think that anything Americans can agree on, it is that. So if Biden's approval ratings are going down, and Euchre is quite right to point to that, it won't be because of China. If anything, China could boost it. You know, having an anti-China policy is almost like a, a position you need to have now. In, 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 in the US. Now, where I suppose does this, there's I suppose the danger, Michael, sorry to interrupt sorry, you, but I suppose no, the danger here is that when you have a Trump-like figure, you know, coming back in 2024, or yep. as a result of midterm elections, someone like him, or, you know, is swaying poli policies, you know, is that going to present any uncertainty 
in stuff like orcas, right? Because this is, you know, this is a decade-long project, at least. You know, a lot yeah. could happen in politics. Well, we, if you could get inside the brain of Donald Trump, I, you know, you'd be, you'd be a very rich man. Um, and probably a very confused one as well, because I'm not sure even Trump knows what's going on inside Trump's brain. Or what he will say from one day to the next. I'm not making the obvious, you know, barbs against Trump, but it, it, the inconsistency in his thinking it, it, it is extraordinary. Look, as we see it from now where we are today on the 25th of November 2021, you know, things are not looking great for the Democrats. But if they're not looking great for the Democrats, I think it's got very little to do with China. It has to do with COVID. It has to do with the economy. It has to do with the deep polarized nature of American society, which is a divided now as it was in the latter part of the 19th century on issues I don't need to go into. If Trump, however, were to come back to answer your question very directly, then uh, Vincent, then actually in some sense, it's all bets are off, all bets are off. But however, if he sees Alcus as part of a broader anti-China strategy, to contain China, and that's essentially what it is about, then I think he will go with it and probably even push it even further down the line. We don't know, we can't predict, but I can't see him backing away from something which has annoyed the Chinese. <laughs> if mm. it's annoyed the Chinese in Trump's worldview, then it must be a good policy. Mm. Nori, I wanted to bring you in. Uh, Michael mentioned this security dilemma, you know, being in the region as China's neighbor. How does Japan navigate all these, you know, challenges, security dilemma uh, Michael was talking about. We've also got a question from, and rather a comment from Catherine, saying the overlap between the court and AUKUS were factor into regional tensions. And she mentioned your know, last year's uh, border clash with India. But I guess, you know, the gist of her comment is, you know, these sort of uh, security packs, whatever you call them, will heighten the tension in the region. And being in the region, how does Japan navigate all these security dilemma and all these uh, uh, heightened tensions? Well, uh, as I mentioned, you know, the, the regional landscape uh, in the Indo-Pacific uh, region and, and uh, uh, especially surrounding Japan, uh, in the East China Sea, South China Sea, uh, they have been rapidly changing and uh, we, have been, we have to be attentive to strengthening uh, Japan-US alliance, which is a linchpin of uh, Japan's foreign, uh, foreign and security policy. But at the same time, we have been trying to engage uh, with other like-minded countries, such as the UK, Australia, France, mm. you name it. You know, so so we, we, are, uh, prom we have been promoting uh, free and open in the Pacific, which is not the security path, but mm. we wish to make sure uh, that, that this region, uh, this, uh, the peace and prosperity should be maintained based on the universal values such as democracy, human rights, and freedom of navigation. So uh, Japanese uh, uh, foreign and security policy has been evolving in light of this rapidly changing uh, security landscape. Uh, that's number one. And number two is as for Quad. Um, so th this uh, comparison between AUKUS and Quad, I mentioned you know, that AUKUS is uh, not the pact or an alliance. Uh, Quad is not the military alliance either. Uh, it is an effort among value sharing like-minded you know, democratic countries to advance a wide ranging practical, practical cooperation for the promotion of uh, uh, free and open in the Pacific. So we have been addressing issues like economic security, supply chain, you know, security issues, or uh, we have been trying to realize uh, vaccine uh, production in India uh, in cooperation with other uh, Quad members. So from our viewpoint, it is um, beneficial. Uh, it makes sense for uh, other like-minded countries, uh, for example, coming from Europe, to engage in the Indo-Pacific region, which is the center of economic growth for years to come. And we need to maintain peace and stability in the region. Now, this is Japan's relationship with outside of Japan. Would the changing security 
challenge security uh, dynamics in the region also be reflected in Japan's internal legislation, for example, when it comes to defense? Do you think this is a likelihood? Yes, uh, so uh, Prime Minister Kishida has mentioned that uh, uh, he is going to review uh, the, the national security strategy, uh, which has uh, been uh, uh, realized uh, over six years ago. So mm. given the, the changing security landscape, uh, we, are in, we are starting to discuss uh, our new national security strategy. And uh, uh, there will be other uh, relevant you know, security policy measures that could be introduced. But that needs to be in collaboration with uh, our allies, uh, especially the United States and other like-minded countries uh, like mm. the UK, Australia. Mm. Yuko, um, so obviously, you know, nobody's talking about publicly about China. Um, someone mentioned, you know, when they were making this announcement, nine minute ad announcement in September, um, no leader uh, talked about China at all. But then journalist questions following the nine minute announcement was all about China. You know, how does this uh, whole AUKUS pact, whether we are reading, it into, uh, re reading too much into it or not, how does this pact change the China's relationship with Australia? Because, you know, this bilateral relationship has been really heavily scrutinized over the last few years. It has changed a lot. How does this you know, going to further deteriorate the whole situation, if, if at all? That's a really good question, Vincent. Um, I think in order to answer your question, I want to go a little bit before the AUKUS pact was um, uh, mm. uh, decided. And I think it's true about, it's still very preliminary stages. But one of the key things in an IR is that what it is, is not what's perceived. From Beijing, this is very much perceived as an alliance system, mm. right? So it is actually lock, um, locking them into what Michael was actually talking about, the security dilemma. So I think on one hand in IR, it's very important to kind of see it from the perception of the specific country. And I think going into um, AUKUS, there was this discussion about the Indo-Pacific, the Indo-Pacific tilt. And I remember discussions around this about, you know, a year and a half ago. And a lot of what I was hearing from the Commonwealth states was, well, you know, the UK was really very much involved in the EU. We for They forgot about the Commonwealth. How seriously are you guys thinking about the Indo-Pacific? And this is what I was hearing um, up until the lead up to the integrated review. So I think in a sense, there was a lot of skepticism about how much this Indo-Pacific tilt was rhetoric. But in a sense, we're seeing not just rhetoric, we have the integrated review, we also have the Indo-Pacific really being each of the countries in Europe is really having this kind of like policy and they're very much becoming much more pivoting again towards Asia. And I think that is really important. And it also reinforces um, this kind of involvement in the region, which shifts the balance of Australia vis-a-vis -vis China. And we all know that China and Australia have had their differences, be it trade, be it this kind of um, inquiry into COVID. And in a sense, it's been really heightened and it's gone up in tensions. And there was a lot of speculation before that if maybe Australia was on their own and this kind of you know rhetoric about the Indo-Pacific was very much rhetoric and the countries were really not going to invest in this. But what's really shown is that you're actually seeing these kinds of statements come out from the, um, the US and UK and Australia, which really shifts the balance in the sense that China's relation with the Australia is not on its own. They've got this kind of backing of these other countries, be it preliminary as it is. And this actually really does heighten the perception of China being encircled. In that sense, I think there's going to be more posturing, but a lot more caution on the side of Beijing in terms of how they deal with Australia, because they're knowing that they're not just dealing with Australia, but a much more bigger kind of um, uh, group um, behind Australia. And it's also, I suppose, it's also interesting to, uh, to you, helpful to review where, you know, how far has Australia come? You know, I remember around two thousand eight or two thousand nine, um, you know, it even quit. Um, uh, what do you call it? Court. There's a quadruple kind of dialogue, right? You know, because they didn't want to get involved in it too much, uh, so that it would upset China. Blah blah blah. So this whole calculation um, among these players in the region is is changing as well. Absolutely, I agree with that. Mm -hmm. um, Michael, I wanted, um, what is your take as a U.S. expert, uh, uh, you know, what is your take on 
this whole kind of changing U.S.-China relationship, you know, in light of all these uh, mm. mini multilateral pacts, so whatever you call it, you know, I think you know you could uh, had a really good point. You know, what matters is the perception, right? How it is actually perceived in Beijing, and they will mm. devise policies uh, to uh, respond to these uh, mm. to, to to these pacts. Yeah, uh, I, I just be a bit autobiographical. I used to, I, I went to China a lot in the period mm. after 2003, 4, 5 with the LSE, and we did a summer school there with Beida, Peking University for nine, 10 years. And without being naive, the, the atmosphere was fairly relaxed, if I can put it like that. And I, I think there's been a, a gradual deterioration, and Francois has written about that in relationship to the South China Seas. We've had the whole issue of Hong Kong, we've had the whole issue of the Uyghurs. You know, we've had the whole question of trade. That's what Trump played on. Mm. Um, so there's been a, a, a gradual ratcheting up, in essence, of a turn from viewing China, to use the Bob Zellick term, as a stakeholder. Responsible bond, stakeholder. <laughs> a responsible stakeholder, by definition, yeah. Uh, you, you got it right there, Vincent. To becoming, if not exactly an enemy, but not exactly a stakeholder. It's kind of very ambivalent. Even the British statement in their in their integrated review on the one on the one very English really spoke on the one hand of it being a competitor, a systemic competitor to use the phrase. On the other hand, we have to seek cooperation with China because frankly, it's too big to leave out. You can't conduct a cold war against an economy which is 16, 17, 18 percent of the world economy, and upon whom glo global China climate change will depend so but there is therefore i think we are at, i wouldn't want to call it a tipping point mm. but I, I kind of do think although i don't want to overstate the importance of alcus per se i think it, it, it forms part of a larger pattern which actually leads the relationship in, in in an entirely different direction to the idea of china being a, a, a responsible uh, stakeholder. I, I, is there a way back from this? And I think this is also one of the things we, sh we need to be discussing as well. Can we devise strategies uh, which both ex accept that there is a highly competitive, stiff competition, as Biden put it, with China on the one hand, yet doesn't want to let that run over into either what some people, I think, unfortunately call a new Cold War, or what even some even not, don't predict could become actually uh, a hot war, or at least in in regional terms. The dangers are there. So it seems to me the questions of responsible intellectuals and responsible uh, states in this is how to avoid the worst, because thinking about the worst helps you devise strategies that may help you avoid it. Mm -hmm. I suppose this is also a question to Nori, right? You know, being a policymaker, how do you think about, how do you approach this question that Michael just raised? Can we devise this strategy? You know, there's a lot of contradictions out there. You know, on the one hand, you will need China's massive market. But on the other hand, you also see it as a systematic competitor challenger, whatever you call it. I suppose in the language vocabulary also converge when it comes to Brussels, London and Washington, as well as in Tokyo these days. I think you are on mute. No. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, of course, uh, uh, Biden administration has been referring uh, to uh, the U.S.-China relations in the context of uh, some areas of confrontation, confrontation or conflicts, or there could be some area for cooperation, such as uh, climate change. And uh, so we need to uh, also take into account uh, uh, economic or trade-related uh, aspects, as well as uh, uh, issues uh, such as uh, climate change, you know, global issues. And um, uh, as you know, uh, both uh, UK and uh, China are applying for uh, CPTPP uh, along with Taiwan. And uh, frankly speaking, not like uh, uh, the the UK, uh, the, the China has to. Uh, overcome uh, many of uh, high standards, you know, TPP provisions, uh, such as, you know, market access, digital commerce, e-commerce, intellectual property rights, state-owned enterprises, government procurement, uh, among others. And these are the issues, you know, that we have been discussing among uh, G7 uh, trade ministers. And uh, 
uh, we, are, we have been discussing these issues in the context of a level playing field, and uh, uh, we, we need to address you know, some of those unfair trading practices. At the same time, uh, Prime Minister Kishida uh, at the APEC Leaders uh, Summit meeting mentioned that uh, the members should refrain you know, from uh, uh, economic coercion. And of course, resorting to economic coercion could be direct violation of WTO rules. And uh, when we are talking about you know, high standard TPP, you know, any applicants cannot resort to economic coercion. So there, there could be ways uh, to influence uh, others uh, beyond uh, security uh, related uh, means. And uh, we need to address uh, China related issues in a, in a comprehensive you know, fashion. Mm-hmm. Going back to the China related issue, uh, Stephen has a specific question for you, Ke. Um, does will Beijing's more cautious approach towards Australia post AUKUS also be reflected in the approach towards neighbors in the South China Sea? You can, what is your take on this? I think it's really important to distinguish um, uh, what China views as their own inherent territory. And so in the sense, you know, you're still seeing incursions into South China Sea and they're still testing the waters here. So in that sense, I think from the Beijing's perspective, it's still very much within their inner seas. Now, the caution, I think, is really exercised around areas such as Taiwan, in the sense that there's a lot of hype and discussion around what China is going to be doing with Taiwan in the lead up to the two centennial, um, uh, sorry, the centennial um, coming up into 2049. Now, I think in that sense, they're always testing the waters, but there's going to be much more caution in the sense that around the Indo-Pacific, there's been more of a... um, uh, commitment for other members in the global community to be more entangled with security issues there. So in that sense, there's going to be testing the waters for where it feels is their integral areas. However, if you see issues where there's going to be triggering other areas, I do not think there's going to be a hot war happening with this. And I think this kind of Cold War narrative is very um uh, on surface, it seems like very um, apt to encapsulate what's happening here. But I, I see this not being an ideology kind of battle. I don't see this um, uh, parallel being useful, except in terms of trying to rely on allies and mm-hmm. U.S. trying to reinvent this kind of, you know, hub and spoke systems number two here, um, BAMT up to 2.0. So there are some parallels, but there's also some kind of distinguishing factors. And I just wanted to pick up on what my Michael actually said about how we're actually in a very different world. In the so very quickly, that, 30 seconds. You oh, can, 30 so seconds. Okay. Out of time. <laughs> it's not, okay. So entangled economies, global issues like climate change and COVID, cooperation and, you know, economies. You know, Nori was actually talking about other areas where we actually can pull China into this kind of economic spheres of inf- um, to talk about commonalities. And I think in a sense, this kind of AUKUS angle is one hand of really dividing this kind of China and the rest, but on the other hand, we can't ignore these global issues as bringing China into the realm of this global community where actually cooperation is the only way forward. Fantastic. I think this is really, really good ending to the to this webinar. You know, it reminds us how complicated is all these issues, whatever you call them, AUKUS, whatever you call them, uh, is, um, and also the fluid nature of regional dynamics, changing regional dynamics. My thanks to everyone who joined us, uh, especially to our speakers, Yuka, Michael, Nori, and Francois in Paris. And uh, thank you to Daiwa for assembling this panel, and thank you all to our listeners Darlene from Europe or from Asia, wherever you are. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for engaging. Bye-bye.